Welcome to the Cardiac Wire Show. My name is Madeline Kane. I'm the host of the show and the editor at Cardiac Wire. Today, I am excited to be joined by Dr. Campbell Rogers from HeartFlow, and he will talk to us today about coronary artery disease imaging and diagnosing. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Rogers. Thank you for having me. So to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you do at HeartFlow? Yeah, of course, I'd be happy to. So I'm a cardiologist by training and practiced. I practiced many years in the cath lab as an interventional cardiologist. Uh, And then I've been working at HeartFlow now almost 11 years, primarily responsible for the evidence generation that has gone on and using the evidence, clinical evidence, to help advance the field of diagnosing coronary disease. So what challenges do physicians currently face when diagnosing coronary artery disease? Yeah, you know, it's an, it's interesting. Coronary disease is so common. It's so prevalent. Number one killer around the world and in the U.S. Yet, despite that, you know, you think, well, surely the tools to diagnose coronary disease must be really good, right? It's so common. Everyone knows heart disease. Everyone has friends or family members who have suffered from coronary disease. Yet, the ways to diagnose it remain surprisingly crude. And historically, there you know the there people have relied on things like stress testing, different forms of stress testing, or invasive angiography, taking somebody and doing an invasive procedure to look at the coronary arteries directly and see if there are if there are narrowings. And the problem is that those methods both over and under diagnose. They over diagnose and say, oh, you know, bad news, you failed your stress test. You need another test or an invasive test only to find out that was wrong and you're, you don't have coronary disease, or perhaps even more concerning, they say, you know, look, you, uh, you passed your stress test. It's great. Good news. Only to have the, act, you know, the facts be that you, it turns out you do have coronary disease and the stress test was wrong and it totally missed it. So those kind of failure modes have been, you know, cardiologists have been dealing with for years, decades, as stress testing was really the, the primary tool available. So what is heart flow doing that's different from those uh, more traditional methods? A couple of things have have changed and have come to the fore. The most important, and then we'll get to the heart flow piece, but the most important has been the emergence of coronary CT angiography. And coronary CT angiography, for those who may not be familiar, is a non-invasive way of looking at the arteries to the heart, seeing whether there are blockages and where they are. And it can be done in just a few minutes with relatively low doses of radiation, a little bit of intravenous contrast. It's not an invasive procedure. And the evidence has gathered over the last 10 or 15 years that coronary CTA is a better approach uh, in and of itself than stress testing, but it has an Achilles heel. And the Achilles heel is that it finds so much disease. It's such a sensitive test that it's very hard pressed based on coronary CT angiography alone for a physician to determine, does this particular narrowing or this particular coronary disease in this patient actually matter clinically? In other words, is it actually limiting blood flow to the heart? And what, so many, many people have blockages which don't limit blood flow. They're important to understand and be on medicines for, but they don't limit blood flow. Others have narrowings that do limit blood flow and may be best served with a procedure such as a stent, maybe even a bypass operation. And distinguishing based on CT and geography alone between those is really hard. So where heart flow fits in is heart flow provides more information based on the CT and geography images, as well as additional processing and analysis and computation, which HeartFlow does. We provide information back to the physician that says, yes, this particular blockage may be limiting blood flow to the following degree, and this patient should be, you know, you should think about treating this patient in an invasive way. Next patient, maybe the blockage is not limiting blood flow. And again, we're able to calculate blood flow through the arteries, and indices, including fractional flow reserve, which is well known in the cardiology world, these indices, which are then 
you know, physicians know what to do with. And they say, okay, I have that information. I have the information from the CT angiogram, and I'm able to put that together and decide how best to treat this patient. And what evidence is there that supports that this FFRCT um, technique is is superior or, or works better, is more precise? Yeah, there is a there is a lot growing body of evidence, a lot of evidence. The uh, you know over several years, evidence has been generated, and we'll talk about the most recent, probably the most impactful piece in a second. But the evidence as a whole has led to significant changes in the guidelines. For example, from the American College of Cardiology suggesting that this pathway of CT angiography and heart flow uh, may be preferred over stress testing. The evidence, uh, most recent piece of evidence is the PRECISE trial, which is a prospective randomized study, which in its essence randomized patients, over 2,100 patients, most of them in the U.S., randomize them to either, these are all patients with symptoms suggesting coronary disease, so somebody who historically, people who would have either been taken for an invasive test or had a stress test of some kind, taken those patients and randomized them you know, in, an equal, in equal amounts, either to have a stress test, invasive angiogram, whatever would have been done, or the other half of patients to have a CT angiogram done uh, and then a heart flow study done uh, if indicated. And the outcome of the study, the primary endpoint that we looked at was the uh, incidence of either patients dying or having a heart attack or having an invasive procedure which was unnecessary, in retrospect, unnecessary, because it was an invasive test, but it didn't show any significant coronary disease. So the combination of those three, any one of those three, and what the study showed was that over a year, the rate of that uh, endpoint happening, again, dying or having a heart attack or having a negative invasive test, uh, that was the rate of that was reduced about 70% in this, what we call the precision pathway, the pathway that relied mostly on CT angiography uh, and on heart flow. So a 70% reduction in those clinical events, which of course matter hugely to patients. Yeah. So this is a 70% reduction compared to people who are getting traditional testing done. Correct. Either a stress test in about 90% or an invasive angiogram in about 10%. Exactly. Dr. Rogers, apart from the 70% reduction, what other key findings uh, came from the PRECISE trial? Uh, that's a great question. The, uh, in any trial of this size, of course, there are all sorts of different analyses that are determined at the beginning. We say we're going to test the following secondary endpoints, if you will, look at the following and there are a couple that jump out. One is that in the group that was randomized to CTA and to heart flow, uh, we saw an increase in the number of patients found who required revascularization, meaning either a stent or a bypass operation. And this was really quite striking because these are patients who in the other group, the stress testing centric group, were being missed. These are patients who it turned out when they had a CT angiogram done, had significant coronary disease and a heart flow study added information there. And if they'd been in the other group, they were missed and they were walking around you know, with significant coronary disease, but having had a stress test at least that did not lead them to the pathway of a stent or a bypass operation. So that's one. So the number of patients requiring revascularization was much higher, quite a bit higher. The second piece was that patients in this pathway of CT and heart flow were much more likely to be prescribed medicines that are widely known to be beneficial for patients with coronary disease. For example, uh, medications to lower cholesterol, like statin drugs, much more likely to have been prescribed and taken in the CT and heart flow group. Also, medicines like aspirin and a couple of others, which uh, work to block platelet function, which is a way of, so they're in some ways think of them as blood thinners. Again, proven to be beneficial in patients with coronary disease. We found them much more likely to have been prescribed and patients taking them in the group assigned to the CT and to heart flow. So those were two of the, I think, probably most important takeaways, both for patients and also for providers. What's driving the increase in prescription there? Do you know? 
Yeah, so that's been studied. This observation about increased in the in in the use of those medicines has been seen in other studies where they've used CT angiography instead of stress testing. And we confirmed that same finding. And what those other studies have 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 looked at is it's more of a behavior observation. So if somebody has a CT angiogram and their doctor has it and they see coronary disease, you know, and the patients can look at this and be shown, oh, look, here's your artery, here's where there's some calcium, et cetera. The observation is that that stimulates both doctor and patient to really know they have coronary disease and to then be more willing to take the steps to combat it as opposed to a stress test, which whether it's positive or negative, it doesn't really look at the arteries to the heart, right? That's the irony of it. Stress tests don't look at the arteries. They're an indirect measure looking at blood flow kind of to areas of the heart muscle. And a patient says, well, you know, your stress test suggests you might have coronary disease. It's not as compelling as to see a picture. Oh my goodness, that's my artery to my heart. There's an area of stuff that shouldn't be there. I'm going to really be diligent in taking these medicines, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of behavioral linkages to the tests themselves, especially the CT angiogram in this case. And how do does HeartFlow's technology relate to the AHA guidelines um, and the growing amount of cardiac CTs that we're seeing? Yeah, great question. So uh, in late 2021, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association together released guidelines uh, on chest pain, practice guidelines related to chest pain. And they were really quite revolutionary uh, at, at when they came out and have been in, in seen that way in the cardiology world. Uh, they did a couple of things. Number one is they said uh, that coronary CT angiography was given a designation of a class of recommendation one level of evidence A, so abbreviated as 1A, uh, and it was the only non-invasive test to be given this designation. Uh, in writing the guidelines, the guideline writers leapfrogged it above stress testing, all forms of stress testing, which were left as a category 1B, so a lower category. Uh, the second thing they did is the guidelines included FFRCT, heart flow FFRCT, uh, for the first time. and gave it a designation of 2A, uh, which, again, really uh, generated a lot of interest uh, and uh, recognition of the role that FFRCT can play. And the guideline writers were quite specific in, 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 in identifying here are the findings on a CT angiogram, which should uh, be seen as an indication for the heart flow study. And it had to do with the level of stenosis. And they said any level of stenosis, 40% to 90%, uh, should be seen as an indication, uh, a two-way indication, class of recommendation uh, for a heart flow study. So now that the precise trial is complete, what what is HeartFlow doing next? What are its next steps? Well, so so I'm going to come back to CT angiography as mentioned. It's increasingly clear in the cardiology world that CT angiography is going to be ever more at the center of diagnosis for coronary disease. You know, in, in cardiology offices, in hospitals, potentially even in primary care settings, and HeartFlow. Uh, we see ourselves as a company committed to developing tools that will help physicians when they use CT angiography. So in that light, we have developed and have now through the FDA, have cleared through the FDA new products, new technologies, which also take CT angiography images and provide back information. These new products provide information not just on the flow, but also on how severe are the narrowings? Is it blocking the artery 5%, 15%, 50%, 90%? 90 and what is the composition of the blockage? Because mm -hmm. one thinks of the blockage as, you know, we think about hardening of the arteries or cholesterol buildup. In point of fact, it's, you know, it's the tissues vary, the tissues that cause the blockage vary from patient to patient. And the variance determines how much risk that patient uh, has from coronary disease. So one person's narrowing may be of a relatively benign called plaque composition. Another person's may be much more concerning based on how much cholesterol is there, how much inflammation and so forth. So our, our other new product, again, cleared through the FDA, quantifies how much plaque there is and then qualitatively describes it. How much of it is calcified? 
How much of it is non-calcified or has appearance that may be concerning for higher risk for the patient? So all of these things are tools which physicians can use based on a process that begins with a CT angiogram and then adds information that cannot be derived by the physician themselves, but require the computational and, anal and analytic tools that we have at HeartFlow. And so it sounds like HeartFlow in the coming years will kind of focus on further refining and developing this technology. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So we have, we've, we've done that. We have new products out and we will continue to seek to provide physicians, you know, make, make physicians' lives easier in terms of interpreting CTA and give them tools that help them more, bring more information back to the patient to help the patient's care. So we've talked about a lot about how cardiac CT is at the forefront of coronary artery disease diagnosing. Um, how do you make sure that HeartFlow's technology remains accessible to providers and patients? That's a very good and important question. The journey to date has, has been focused both on developing evidence, as we've spoken about, but also influencing effectively and constructively and working with other stakeholders in the sort of ecosystem of healthcare. And in particular, I mean the people and, uh, and, and organizations that pay for healthcare. They may be insurance companies, they may be governments, they may be Medicare, they may be uh, government payers in other countries. And making sure that we provide evidence to them that is uh, compelling and, and helps educate them on, boy, is this an approach which makes sense for the patients we're responsible for? And do we want to make sure that physicians and systems are economically compensated for using this in an effective way? It's sort of in the, in the world of value in healthcare, right, which is such a, an important concept and growing concept to make sure that, look, if we can bring things forward that avoid invasive procedures, for example, hey, that's great for patients, but it also avoids significant costs to the healthcare system and making sure that we have evidence to show. And if we're able to do that and payers in the healthcare world uh, are, are, on, uh, are supportive, then that helps physicians to adopt. The second area is that, you know, as we've grown, we're now active in, you know, the 80% of the top U.S. heart hospitals. Uh, we have sites that have been using this pathway and heart flow for many years. Those sites really are references for us now with their peers. And many other hospitals and practices are coming forward and saying, look, we've heard what's been going on at this and such a site. We know their results have been really compelling. Uh, we've seen the clinical data, we've seen the guidelines. So let's, you know, we want to bring this into our own practice and help our patients with it. Thank you so much, Dr. Rogers, for joining us today. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. If what Dr. Rogers was talking about is interesting to you, then please feel, feel free to reach out to him and his team at HeartFlow with any questions. Thank you for having me.